Well, welcome everybody. Glad you could be here. Um, we don't have a ton of time. Whoa, that, that did increase my sound, didn't it? <laughs> Got to be careful where I talk here. Um, we only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to run through this really quick. I'm going to try to give some time for questions. Uh, just know I'm product marketing, so I can't get too technical. <laughs> so, good. Anyway, uh, my name is Q Mangus. That is my real name, Q. And yes, we talked about how that's a character in Star Trek, and I'm not part of the Q continuum. Anyway, I'm really excited to be here today. We're going to talk about a really cool topic, and that's the idea of being able to integrate the mainframe into your broader IT security strategy. Here's a little bit about what we're going to talk about. We're going to touch on some stats when it comes to cybersecurity, what's been going on out there in the marketplace. We're going to look at some case studies to kind of support those stats um, and look at what happened with those organizations. <clears throat> Then we're going to look at some of our solutions here at Microfocus and how they fit into what we're talking about. Finally, I'll give you some resources. So, you know, we're talking about cybersecurity. This isn't anything new, right? Um, securing systems and data, it's been around for a long time. But what I want to touch on today is this idea, as I stated in the, in the intro, of extending enterprise IT controls to the mainframe. You know, typically, authentication is done. Uh, in the enterprise IT through a corporate IAM, and on the mainframe it's done through, say, RACF, ACF2, or top secret. So there's really disparate systems. What we want to touch on today is how to have an overall strategy in an organization to be able to have one set of solutions across the board. So we'll touch on that, is being able to extend that. OK, to begin, let's touch on some stats. Um, if you've been paying attention at all, <laughs> right, cybersecurity, those threats are on the rise. There's a greater impact than there's ever been. In fact, there was a recent report. Uh, Verizon does an annual data breach investigations report, and the most recent one found that credentials were the primary means in which a bad actor gets access uh, into an organization. In fact, 63% of breaches were attributed to that, to credentials. Uh, ransomware, the global uh, attack volume has increased. You know, if you look at the first six months of 2021, it went up 151% compared to the year previous. So ransomware continues to increase. Um, the cost of data breaches actually continues to increase. Um, globally, in 2021, that's the most recent stat, we're looking at $4.24 million is the average cost of a breach. Well, insane. Well, in the United States, it's even worse. We're just over $9 million is the average cost of a breach. Okay, once again, that impact's greater than it's ever been. And uh, data breaches have exposed 22 billion records in 2021. Okay, so those are some stats. Stats can say a lot of things, right? <laughs> Let's actually look at some case studies and look at some what has actually happened to support what those stats are saying. You'll probably remember these. This is go, OK. <laughs> in 2021, there was a lot of high-profile security breaches. It seemed like they just kept coming, one after the other after the other. I'm going to review a few that you may remember. OK, Colonial Pipeline, I'm assuming all of you remember this. Um, they were breached, which caused the shutdown of their operations on the East Coast, which led to uh, panic buying of gasoline, right? And which led to a spike in prices as well. What's interesting with this one is that, oh, and they ended up having to pay $5 million to get their systems back up online uh, in ransom. What's interesting with this particular case is that uh, the hackers or the bad actors were able to breach the system with one compromised password. Just one password caused this much damage. So back to that Verizon uh, report, yeah. Credentials are used in a majority of cases when a breach happens. Okay, another one is JBS Meets. If you remember this one, uh, this was also ransomware. Uh, what's interesting with this one is that the encryption took place in June, but it was actually an advanced persistent threat, or an APT. Um, for those of you who may not know what that is, it's basically that a bad actor gets into a system undetected, and now they can roam around and do all kinds of crazy stuff without being detected. Um, they can encrypt things, they can steal data. Um, and so they actually waited until June to uh, encrypt that data, and then JBS Meets had to pay out. And they're a global meatpacking company, so they had to pay out to get their systems back online. Um, 
Okay, the final one, and this one's interesting too because of one particular thing that happened. So Brenteg was breached, and the bad actors, it was a dark side affiliate, they actually claimed that they got access to the system by purchasing credentials on the dark web. So they were able to get these credentials and breach the system by purchasing some credentials. Crazy. So this, this like I said, a lot of things happened in 2021. Uh, these are a few highlights. What I want to do is let's talk about some recent ones. This one happened in June of 2022. This was Experian. This was an interesting thing. I, I just want to make mention of something before I talk about this. Is We know this, right? Bad actors are persistent, and they change their tactics. They are out to get some money, right? And so they, they change what they do, and they look for any kind of vulnerability that's out there. Well, inter interestingly enough, these bad actors were able to hijack Experian accounts simply by going in and changing the email address that is used um, to act, to, that's attached to the account. And this email address was also used to reset the password. So the users were actually given notification, hey, your, your email address has been changed. But at that point, it was too late. These uh, bad actors got control of these accounts. Um, you know, this just shows that even a credit bureau, which has been breached in the past, has some work to do. OK, Marriott. Um, I feel for these guys, right, for Marriott. <laughs> uh, over the past four years, they've had three big data breaches. Um, the most recent one being just uh, in this last year. Um, luckily, this was isolated to one server at one hotel. But what's interesting with this one with Marriott is that the attackers use social engineering. Um, you know, and, and this is the idea of trying to trick a user to give out their credentials. So it could be a, a phishing email. It could be a spoofed URL. In this case, the a user in Marriott gave out the credentials unknowingly, and uh, they, were, they were breached via social engineering. And they reportedly made off with about 20 gig of data. OK, the final one is T-Mobile. This one actually happened last year, but I bring this up because T-Mobile has reached a settlement of $350 million that they're paying out to their customers because of this breach. Now, with the T-Mobile breach, this was actually done in a more traditional way, which is brute force. It was a brute force attack. Basically, they were just using trial and error to guess that password or that, that login credential. So. I don't bring up these cases to cast these organizations in a bad light. But what I will say is that these are large organizations with very big budgets for IT security. Uh, why didn't they secure their systems the way they should have or the way we think they should have? Well, the idea here is that it is hard. It's a difficult thing to do, and the bad actors keep changing tactics. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is just some things that you can do and things that can work together to help prevent you from being one of these <laughs> that we talk about, right? <laughs> to help you uh, make sure that you're not breached in the same way. OK, let's, let's move on. There's a lot of. There's one other thing that I want to touch on, and that's these regulations and, and guidelines that have been brought out. Now, a lot of these, were, a lot of these regulations were brought up as um, a response to breaches that happened. Some of them are trying to be proactive, but uh, they're trying to close these loopholes, right? And I know this is really hard to read, but the idea is there. Yeah, PCI DSS, or the Payment Credit Card Industry, or Data Security Standard, basically saying that any organization that's using credit cards should have strong access control measures, uh, including multi-factor authentication. I'm going to touch on that a lot. MFA is a big one. OK. GDPR, we've all heard of this one, right? And basically, this is that users need to have a legitimate need to access personally identifiable information to do their job. Not everybody should be accessing this sensitive information. And GDPR spells that out. It spells out a lot of things, but that's one of the things that it touches on that I want to touch on today. Next. <laughs> the New York State Department of Financial Services. Basically, this is saying that financial services companies need to make sure that they have strong authentication. Multi-factor authentication is the one that it specifically spells out for any financial services corporation. Uh, to be able to access systems and data, they need to have that MFA. OK, if you remember this one, there's just a couple more that I want to touch on. The HSPD-12, or Homeland Security Presidential Directive 12, this one came out because of the OPM breach. 
basically saying that a username and password isn't enough. So any federal agency needs to, or those working with federal agencies, need to have more than just a username and password to be able to access those systems and data. And then as we learn more, this was shown in a thing in the keynote today, but we know that as of last year, there was an executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. Basically, these, this executive order states that federal agencies and those doing business with federal agencies should be using multi-factor authentication. So that's brought up again is this idea of having multiple factors before you can authenticate. And then the IRS, go, <laughs> maybe I need to point it at the thing. <laughs> the IRS recently came out and had guidelines similar where they stated that uh, the IRS or anybody doing business with the IRS should be using multi-factor authentication, of those multiple factors to authenticate. Okay, so that's kind of the situation we're in. Like I said, those guidelines are, and regulations help close those loopholes, help give direction. But what's interesting is failure to comply with these can actually lead to, lead to fines and sanctions um, for these regulated industries. So that's something else we have to contend with, right? <laughs> um, okay, so let's touch on control. So I've given you, you know, some statistics. I've given you some case studies. Let's actually touch on some controls that can help. Um, authentication. Strong authentication. That kind of was touched on those regulations, but the idea here, as we saw, is accessing data and systems is what is required for a breach, right? They have to actually get in there. Well, having strong authentication makes it that much harder to access, and MFA, or multi-factor authentication, is probably the strongest authentication method out there. Um, so, I mean, think about today how, uh, you know, I talked to a lot of mainframe organizations, and they're still using a case insensitive eight character password to get to the mainframe, right? And that's, that's as far as they go. Um, and for a lot of years, that was good enough. Um, but now the mainframe is in a whole new world, right? <laughs> so it needs to be secured. And, you know, we know that we have this. With mainframe organizations, you have those two points of authentication. I touched on that before. On the, on the enterprise side, there's the enterprise IAM. And then on the mainframe side is RACF, ACF2, or top secret. What we want to touch on is how you can extend enterprise multi-factor authentication to the mainframe and have one solution across the board. Because, you know, the way it works now is you, there's many organizations, you're probably one of them has MFA for the mainframe, and then they have MFA for the, for the, for the enterprise. What we want to touch on is being able to have it across the board. Okay, authorized access only. This one's fascinating to me, and that is the sense that only authorized users should access systems and data that they need. It should be based on the principle of least privilege. And what that principle says is that a user should only have access to systems and data that they have a legitimate need to access to do their job. So let's think about that for a minute. I work in marketing. I have access to reports for website visits for, to see how campaigns are doing. Uh, I have, of course, access to my email but I don't have access to, say, finance, or I don't have access to sales commission. Really, I shouldn't. Why should I? That's the idea, right? Start with this zero trust um, and add what is needed for a user to do their job. That's reducing that surface of vulnerability. Um, once again, I talked about uh, authentication is done in two places, and authorization is the same thing. What, what the ideal situation would be is to actually stop an, on, uh, an unauthorized user from actually even getting to the mainframe. Uh, that would be the best thing, is, is, is having a system in place to actually stop them from actually ever getting to the mainframe. OK, a couple more controls. This is interesting because they work better together, so I'm going to touch on that a little bit too. But really, this idea behind data encryption and protecting sensitive data. We know this, right? The mainframe is the backbone of many organizations, and it holds a lot of sensitive information, personally identifiable information. Um, this information needs to be protected at all times, uh, meaning that that data needs to be encrypted, whether it's in transit or at rest. Um, depending on the role in an organization, uh, that, that information should be redacted or masked. Um, and the idea is through encryption or masking or tokenization slash anonymization, this, this is the why. <laughs> why should you be doing this? It's this idea that if a bad actor does get into your system 
and we've seen it happen. If they have, if they get in and data is encrypted, data is masked, the damage that they can do is lessened because that that information is protected. So that's the idea: is trying to reduce the ability that if a breach happens, for those bad actors to get to that sensitive information. And then, of course, you know we know that a lot of breaches can happen because of internal employees. That happens a lot of times, um, and so having this role-based access or that principle of least privilege can also help so that users are only accessing what they should be accessing to uh, do their job. Okay, the final one is endpoint hardening. Um, this can be at the operating system level or at the application level. Um, once again, this is that principle of least privilege, uh, controlling what a user has access to, what systems they have access to. Uh, so, you know, think about how access to the mainframe is done. Uh, it's done via terminal emulation solution, um, and they get to that mainframe and input that case insensitive eight character password potentially. Um, what we want to do is make sure that, uh, that systems are put in place to uh, reduce that surface of vulnerability and only give them access to the systems and data that they need. I mean, for example, with terminal emulation, should every user be able to edit macros? Uh, should they be able to change their security settings? Um, that is based on role, right? And so that needs to be put in place. Okay, the other part of endpoint hardening, there's a couple of other things there, is of, co of course security patches. Uh, security patches are brought out many times as a reaction to a breach, right? Okay, the, we found this known vulnerability. Uh, it's been exploited. Let's get a patch out there to uh, reduce that risk, to, to harden <laughs> those endpoints. Um, so security patches need to be applied immediately or at the most within 30 days of release. And then the final one is, is this secure lifecycle development. And that is the ability to be able to, as applications are being developed, that you can check the code for known vulnerabilities. Um, that's an important part of endpoint hardening as well. Okay. So that's where we are today. <laughs> Those are some controls, and like I said, they work better together. I'm going to finish up with that in just a minute, but before I do, um, let's touch a little bit on worst solutions for microfocus fit. I'm looking to see how much time we have. We're doing good. Okay. So we know there are challenges when it comes to mainframe applications, right? Um, likely they were written before these modern security mandates, like the PCI DSS, so they're not really addressing that. <clears throat> There we go. Got to be careful. Got it now? OK. Oh, he's right there. I didn't see you. <laughs> OK. There it is. Um, OK, so that data, as I stated before, that data is not always appropriate for all users internally. And, and many times, it's not appropriate for external users. And of course, right? mainframe applications can be costly to update. Do you even have access to the source code to some of those applications? Uh, do you have the resources to do that? So that's, that's the challenges that are different when it comes to cybersecurity and mainframe applications. Um, and I'll touch on some ways to help. Uh, the first one is this, okay, I was talking about data privacy. Uh, the first thing I'd like to touch on is redaction. This is done through our uh, terminal emulation solutions, our flagship emulators, uh, Reflection, Rumble Plus, InfoConnect. But the idea is this, Redaction is that obscuring of any fixed or variable data field for data protection. Yeah, I know you've probably all seen this, but I'll show it in just a minute. Some, things, some ways to redact is you can redact or mask in the application. That would require a code change. So that's some work, but that's one way. Uh, presentation level, that would be role-based. You don't have to make a change to the code. Or it can be even done at the data level. Um, and once again, this should be role-based according to least privilege. So depending on a user's role in an organization, that depends on what they should be able to access. So the idea is here, right? Okay, some users should be able to access and see the account number and the, and the credit card, depending on the role, but not everybody. Um, so data masking would make it look like that. Just mask those, those sensitive fields, that personally identifiable information. That's data masking. Now, similar to data masking, but a little different. You've probably all seen this, but tokenization or anonymization. This is basically scrambling sensitive information. So you can see here on, on the, depending on your view, it's my right. <laughs> 
you have the personally identifiable information, a social security number, date of birth, credit card, and then on my left, you've got the scramble. Um, and this is done through our product called MicroFocus Voltage. This is at the data level. Um, and then that can be decoded um, as well. So that's tokenization or anonymization, being able to scramble that in information. Okay, so we're talking about um, accessing systems and data. So, um, you know, think about, well, recently here at MicroFocus, we came out with a solution called the Host Access Management Security Server. This is basically allowing you to leverage the uh, corporate IAM to authenticate users to the mainframe. So think about how a user, once again, accesses the terminal emulation. Think how they do that today. They go use a terminal emulator. They get to the mainframe, in many cases using a case-insensitive uh, eight-character password. Um, what needs to happen is there needs to be that wall of protection, uh, being able to authenticate a user before they ever get to that mainframe. And so that's what the host access management security server does. It forces a user to authenticate via the corporate IAM before they ever get to the mainframe. And in addition to that, the, corporate I, the enterprise IAM can be a multi-factor authentication solution. Um, and any multi-factor authentication solution can work with, this, with uh, the host access management and security server as long as it works with SAML. So now they're using multi-factor authentication going through, controlled by the host access management and security server before they ever get to that, uh, to the mainframe, before they're ever accessing that, those applications. That's the idea there, right? So now you're leveraging one mainframe, or excuse me, one multi-factor authentication solution across the board. Okay, now let's touch a little bit about the secure zero footprint host access. The idea here is it's, the, it's a browser-based uh, terminal emulation solution. Um, so over here you have, you know, a, a tablet, an I, like an iPad, an iPhone, a desktop, a laptop. Um, a user will have to authenticate using that same host access management and security server. Once they do that, then they're going to be able to get to the mainframe using a browser. All that is encrypted from end to end, so now they have the ability to offer a solution to users to be able to access the, the mainframe from a browser, um, a true zero footprint host access solution. Now, there's some security advantages here. Um, all the patches can be applied at that server, so it doesn't have to be done on each endpoint. Now it's just done at the server level. Uh, security changes can be done there as well. So think of the move from SSL to TLS. It can be done right there on that, on that central server. Um, you're controlling what is access can be done from that central location as well. Um, so once again, we're talking about terminal emulation, being able to control if, if a user can edit macros or can edit their security settings. That can all be done from that central secure server. So that's the idea here uh, behind the security play when it comes to that secure zero footprint host access is being able to have that centrally manage control um, of your terminal emulation. Okay, two more things, and I think we'll have some time for questions. Um, one thing I did fail to mention, I'm gonna go back here. You'll notice I put a little key right here at the bottom <laughs> to kind of touch on what these things address. So like this one's addressing that data privacy. Um, these are like endpoint hardening, authorization, uh, authentication. Um, so yeah, the secure zero footprint one addresses all of them. Uh, okay, now the final one is uh, MicroFocus Advanced Authentication. So this is our, our multi-factor authentication solution. And the power of our authentication, or our multi-factor authentication solution is that it supports multiple factors. You can see a few here up on the screen. Um, uh, that's where the power comes in. Now, we offer this solution, of course, and that's a multi-factor authentication solution that you can use. And what we can do, and what we recently came up with, is we have this, the advanced authentication connector for ZOS. So now you can extend that multi-factor authentication solution to support your mainframe users. Five minutes, thanks. Okay, let's touch on the last one, and that is uh, when it comes to application security. Uh, what we were talking about with endpoint hardening is that secure lifecycle management. So with our solution, MicroFocus Fortify, you're actually able to scan 
uh, code for known vulnerabilities. And this can be done on mainframe applications, on COBOL applications, and of course other enterprise applications as well. Um, and this is that idea, right, that you need to be able to check your software at the beginning and throughout that life cycle of, of development uh, to be able to check for known vulnerabilities and, and address those uh, while that code's being written. Okay, I want to summarize what we've talked about. We have just a couple of minutes here. Um, there's, a, there's a concept here, and that's called defense in depth. And what defense in depth is actually uh, based on a, it's a strategy that's based on a military principle. And this principle is that it's more difficult for an enemy to breach a multi-layered and a complex defense system than it is to penetrate a single layer. Makes sense, right? You have one thing, <laughs> you have a fence, you can penetrate the fence, but if you have a fence and guard dogs and barbed wire, and, you know, a more complex system is going to be better and a complicated one. And so the, the idea when it comes to what we're talking about here is there needs to be multiple security countermeasures to protect the, inform the, the integrity of the information assets in the enterprise. So the controls that we're talking about, they work better together. If you're using just encryption, that's good. But if you use encryption plus multi-factor authentication, that's better. If you use all the controls in conjunction with one another, you're going to be that much more secure. Um, we know that these security breaches are unplanned. We need to be ready for them, but it can happen at any moment. But by having those controls work together, it's going to be better. So those are the controls, once again, uh, that strong authentication, having only the authorized access, that principle of least, least privilege, having data privacy encryption, and having that endpoint hardening. Having these controls work together is better. And as I stated before, being able to have one set of controls across the entire enterprise is going to be your best option here because you're not going to have those disparate systems. That's what we really want to do is integrate them all together. I've given you some resources. The, this presentation is up as a PDF, um, so you can download it and click on those links to learn more. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information there for you. Um, but that's really that's the story that I want to make sure that everybody walks away from from this, is that we don't have to have systems working against each other, or disparate systems in an organization. You can have one set of systems uh, ensuring the, the security of your organization. Okay, that's it. My contact information is there. Feel free to reach out to me. I will take any questions if you have them. Um, and if I can't answer them, of course, I will uh, get back to you. <laughs> any questions? I think we have a couple minutes. Oh, we have exactly two minutes. <laughs> okay. Is there Sorry, what was that? Is there a multi-factor authentication solution by micro for IDFC? Yeah, so our advanced so that was the solution I showed before. So the question was is there an advanced authentic or is there a multi-factor authentication solution for Z, right? And what we do is we have an advanced authentication solution and then a connector to connect for uh and connect that advanced authentication solution to ZOS. But that, so we do offer a multi-factor authentication solution at MicroFocus, and, and we can extend that through that connector. I think that's a really interesting point here. Why did you go shopping for two different MFA solutions when you should have one MFA solution now extend? Is that yep. way right behind Thanks, Misty. So the, what, what Misty said for, for everyone to hear is, uh, why would you want multiple multi-factor authentication solutions in an organization, more than one, where you can have one solution across the board? Now, we have a solution, of course, with the advanced authentication solution, and, and we'd, of course, want you to purchase that and use it. But you don't have to. Um, with our host access management security server, you can use any MFA solution and extend that uh, as long as you're using our terminal emulation solutions. But that's the idea, is having one multi-factor authentication solution across the board. Good. And I think we're out of time. Yes, we're out. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody, for being here. Once again, if you want to come talk to us some more, um, please visit us uh, and go to those resources that I had. Go check out this presentation. Uh, you can get the PDF. Thanks, everybody.